Well, once again, thank you very much to you all for joining us from uh, all around the world. That it is a privilege to speak to you on behalf of the United Nations, particularly the United Nations Academic Impact here, uh, at the building of the UN Secretariat in New York. Uh, we're having this event in, in conjunction uh, and with the framework of our partnership uh, with MCN and also within the framework of the SDG Conference Bergen 2022, um, which is uh, a tradition that has been uh, now um, you know, in the works for the University of Bergen in Norway, which also happens to be um, the UNAI SDG hub for goal 14 is one institution of higher education that has been uh, at the forefront of the advancement of the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So it is a real privilege to be here and, and particularly at the very beginning of the year uh, when we uh, within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it is important for us to realize the importance of the work that is being conducted uh, in the universities, uh, in colleges, in research centers, think tanks, but also the critical relevance of the work that is being conducted by students uh, and, and, and the innovation, the creativity, the knowledge that lies in the student body of all the campuses around the world. And uh, MCN is, you know, one of these partners that one has that is instrumental in not only inspiring, but also promoting precisely um, this, uh, this concept of sustainability at the grassroots level and with the with the participation of so many students, actually hundreds, if not thousands of students around the world over the past few years. Uh, we have today just a, just an example, just an excerpt of that, uh, of the of the incredible work um, that students are doing um, uh, around the planet. In addition to one student from our SDG hub for goal 16, the Montfort, uh, university in the United Kingdom. Um, so we're going to have uh, some minutes to go through uh, many different stories covering different SDGs and the SDGs in general uh, from various geographic perspective and from different voices from from students themselves. So we're going to let students to speak on their own behalf and, and to hear their thoughts uh, and, and to inspire us all. Um, and with that, I'll stop here and I would like now to give the floor to uh, Noha and Abigail uh, from NCN uh, yeah. to, to, to tell us why they think it is important to, to hear the voices of Jews and to hear uh, the experiences of university students, to know what they are really doing uh, regarding the SDGs. Some people might think the SDGs is something because they were adopted by member states of the UN. That is solely the responsibility of member states to do that uh, at the top level when in practice. And actually the 2030 agenda uh, clearly express, uh, expresses that fact. Academia is a key factor. Youth is a huge component. Uh, if we really want to see uh, the SDGs achieved by 2030, which is just around the corner, we really need to pay attention to what our students are doing. So I give the floor to Noha and Abigail. Thank you so much, Omar. And hi, everybody. It's amazing to see so many people here today, and it's wonderful to be here with you in this call. Uh, my name is Noha. I'm the Programs Director here at MCN Millennium Campus Network. Um, we're a nonprofit based in Boston, and our, our mission is to meet what Omar just said, to be able to work with young people and to train young people um, as they work to engage in social impact work and advance the sustainable development goals. And so um, we've been we've been really honored to to work with students since 2008 um, and and find ways to support the work that they're doing um, with the belief that there a lot of the the change that has happened not just now but over the past you know decades has always been influenced by academia by young people by the change that young people want to see and 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 the the issues that they're seeing and the problems that they're seeing and the and the solutions and change that they're pushing for um and we continue to see this now with with a lot of you know including you know things like climate change and the movement around climate change being powered by young people um and and, and 
in education and advocates for quality education and so many other more um, SDGs, you know, powered by, you know, young people advocating for change and calling for um, for for progress um, in, in order for everybody and for especially young people who have a bigger stake um, in their future to, to see the world be in a better place. And so um, we, we've been really thrilled to, to partner with UNI since 2018 in um, one of our signature programs, uh, which is the Millennium Fellowship. Um, and you'll be hearing from incredible Millennium Fellows here today to uh, be able to work and take social impact and advancing the SDG goals into the next step. And so working with young students who are undergraduates around the world um, in being able to learn about, you know, ways of advancing the SDGs, thinking about very specific projects and solutions to, um, to topics that, you know, personally they care about and are invested in and uh, providing them with the, the trainings, the connections and the recognition to advance the work that they're doing to learn about the work that um, that that adds value and impact to not just, you know, the, their their own campus and their community, but also adds up to be a worldwide impact and a global impact. And so in 2021, just this past November, we had our class of 2021 Millennium Fellows graduate uh, with one more than 2000 Millennium Fellows over 136 campuses in 30 nations um, and we are we're very excited to see um, to and to be able to do this with with you and I and with the United Nations Academic Impact it's been an honor and um, really excited to be able to uh, see more young people in, engaged um, on the Millennium Fellowship on more activities in in pushing for change in pushing for the advancement of the SDGs um, and uh, a fun fact uh, last year and oh, since 2018 our fellows are advancing all 17 and so you know whether we had fellows that are passionate about no poverty or you know peace or climate change um, everybody comes in with their passion with with their personal motivation for what they want to do and uh, we've been we've been really honored to support so uh, with that I'd love to pass it on to Abigail to share a little bit more and uh, also talk Talk about her personal experience as a Millennium Fellow and the work that she's doing here with MCN. So over to you, Abby. Thank you so much, uh, Omar and, and Noha, for this wonderful introduction. And we feel deeply thankful to United Nations Academic Impact to create this space and the opportunity to share and hear these remarkable young leaders uh, about their own stories. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Abigail Canales. I'm currently Partnerships Manager of Millennium Campus Network and also a former alumni of Millennium Fellowship. Uh, back at the days when I was a medical student at 2018 at your home, as we said, in Mexico at the Universidad de Monterrey. Uh, and I love to quote something that I said those days that I'm still holding. Uh, the opportunity to acquire knowledge about this great movement give us the ability to observe different types of panoramas around the world, learn about different social projects, the wonderful people who create them, and acquire the values and tools necessary to contribute to our countries, and this be able to be involved at a global level to support people with this same altruistic soul. And it's wonderful to have the opportunity to see and contribute to the journey of these young leaders and with these beautiful souls, always seeking to support people in need, always seeking to change the status quo of a messy world. Uh, they don't give up. Young leaders are fighters, resilient soldiers of peace. Young, young leaders are, and their good hearts, are the hope for the future. Uh, so thank you so much. I'd love to introduce uh, our first wonderful change maker, recent former alumni from the Millennium Fellowship, Marisa Moyena. Are you here, Marisa? Hi, yes, I am. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk about um, my social impact project um, and my experiences with the fellowship as well. Um, I actually have some slides. Can I just share my screen? Yes, yes, you are a presenter. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. There's PowerPoint. Okay, cool. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about my project, which is called um, Invisible Hands Philadelphia. Um, and I am from, I am a student at the University of Pennsylvania, um, which is in the United States. Um, so just a little bit of background about who I am. Um, I am, like I said, a student at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I will be graduating this May, um, so I'm a senior right now. I am currently studying global health and chemistry. Um, and just some of my interests generally are um, promoting sustainable and equi equitable global health outcomes. Um, I've always been really interested in um, all of the different social determinants of health, health access, food insecurity, housing, education, um, and how all of these different factors and socioeconomic factors and disparities um, manifest themselves in health disparities, which I think is really applicable, especially to a lot of um, inner cities in the United States. Um, and I've always also particularly been interested um, in addressing food insecurity among disenfranchised communities and in world hunger. Um, in my past, I've done a lot of work with Philabundance, um, which is an organization in the city of Philadelphia that does a lot of work um, with food insecurities. They um, work with a lot of low income families to help them get healthy, nutritious meals. And they were sort of like my inspiration um, for the project. And I've actually been able to work with them a lot, which has been really cool. Um, so these are some of my motivations for wanting to start my project and for um, the idea behind Invisible Hands Philadelphia. Um, and so what exactly is Invisible Hands Philadelphia? Um, so it's a nonprofit organization, like I said, that I founded specifically to address food insecurity in the city of Philadelphia, um, which is a really big problem in the city um, and plays a lot of roles in um, a lot of the health disparities that we see in the city. Um, just as um, for some perspective, throughout the United States, um, about 12% of people are classified as food insecure, but in Philadelphia, it's about 21%. Um, so just compared to the rest of the nation, um, the city does deal a lot with um, food insecurity and um, with vulnerable communities having access to food. Um, so I founded this organization to really address that, um, but also to specifically address these conditions that have been exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I started this project sort of in response to the pandemic, um, because as we all know, the pandemic um, has really put a strain on all of the health and social infrastructure for many countries and has really made a lot of the disparities worse for disenfranchised communities, which was really happening here in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> so the goal of the project is to target individuals that are already vulnerable and disadvantaged, um, including low income communities, those that are immunocompromised, uninsured, elderly, homeless, um, and also racial and ethnic minorities. Um, and so basically how the organization works, it's a contract free delivery service in which young, healthy, um, volunteers are recruited to deliver groceries, prescription medications, and other basic essentials um, to these vulnerable families and communities in Philadelphia that have difficulty with being able to leave their homes, particularly during the pandemic. Um, so it allows these populations to still have access to their basic necessities and resources um, from the safety and comfort of their own homes, which was really relevant, I think, during the pandemic. Um, for populations that were struggling and that were most at risk, particularly those um, that are elderly and immunocompromised, um, suffering from things like HIV, things like that. Um, and so essentially how it works is there is a website and a phone number where anyone in the city of Philadelphia can place an order for groceries, medications, um, any essentials, and then that order will be sent out to a volunteer network that we have with volunteers stationed all over the city. Um, and anyone can claim that order and then we'll perform a contact free delivery to whoever placed the order. Um, and I think initially this project I started, like I said, in response to COVID, but I think what's really been cool is to see how it's grown beyond the pandemic and how I think it's been really applicable just in general with addressing things like transportation barriers and things that exist um, outside of, of the pandemic. Um, and so in addition to this volunteer, um, the delivery service, there's also a hotline number that I created, um, which has been really great because volunteers all over the country virtually have been able to staff the hotline number. Um, and so anyone that 
is interested in just being connected to resources and learning about what resources are available in the city, um, they can call the number and I have um, volunteers that I've trained that will um, are trained to answer questions and direct um, people to different services and benefits that um, they can apply for, that they're interested in, different resources that they may not know about. Um, and in addition to this, there's also community partnerships um, where I've partnered with local food banks and food pantries um, that serve particularly homeless populations in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so volunteers in this way, we will um, uh, help out the pantries by helping to package food and deliver them to um, the clients that they normally serve, which has been really great because a big barrier for a lot of these pantries has been having people to actually deliver the food. Um, and so their participants um, don't have to leave their homes and aren't facing transportation barriers with coming to the food pantries. Um, and we also assist in preparing the food, um, which has been really cool. So there's a lot of different um, aspects to the organization. And I think a goal that I really have and that has been is really just integrating myself within the city, making the organization something that's sustainable and long term um, and creating these partnerships with, with organizations in Philadelphia um, and working towards a shared vision. Um, and so I wanted to, oh, so results so far. So this is from the beginning of the fellowship up until um, now. And so I have a volunteer network. There's around 200 volunteers right now that um, are sustainable, consistent volunteers that we've been working with, um, which is really cool. It's actually like, I think it's really taken off the ground and was really more than I anticipated, honestly. Um, so it's been really great to see the support and all the people that are interested in. Um, and over 500 deliveries have been completed since I started the fellowship um, to families and individuals all over the city of Philadelphia. Um, and some community partners. So these are just um, some food pantries and food banks that I've really partnered with and become really close to and well integrated with throughout the past few months. And so we work with these food pantries to deliver food to their clients, um, to their um, and help to package food as well and deliver meals to families that are low income and that um, are facing barriers such as transportation and, and really struggling with getting to the pantry. And so I think eliminating that barrier um, has really made a big difference. Um, and so I wanted to share some pictures um, throughout the past few months. We've asked volunteers to take pictures of themselves while they're completing their deliveries. Um, and so these are just a few examples of different volunteers. Some of them are students from the same university that I go to. Some of them are adults, really people from all different backgrounds and age um, age ranges. So. Um, the bottom picture here is someone actually picking up and buying the groceries for someone that placed the order. And then the one on the left is people delivering the groceries. Um, these are just some more pictures of different um, uh, deliveries being done. And these are just a few of our really consistent volunteers that have really helped out a lot with the project. Again, this is one volunteer just um, this kind of shows how the process works. So like I said, someone will place a delivery in order online and then a young healthy volunteer will go pick up the food for that person and deliver it to them. So it's a contract free delivery service, which you can see in the bottom left picture. Someone is, um, you know, they drop off the food and then leave. So there's no issues with contact and um, especially with the pandemic, that's something that we really tried to, to emphasize. This is again another order being um, delivered. And another, so on the right is actually um, someone, a family that was receiving the delivery. Um, they wanted to be featured on our social media, so we took a picture of them. Um, and on the left is two, again, two of our other really consistent volunteers. They actually were doing a pretty big order, as you can see from all the bags in the car. Um, and so just tying into the fellowship and what I really um, learned from the fellowship and how the fellowship really helped my project to grow and reach levels that I, I don't think would have been possible alone. Um, my SDGs were number two and number 10, um, zero hunger and reduced inequalities. And so I think something that really helped a lot with the application of my project and really achieving um, what I have 
was um, some of the, the SMART goals that we learned about, which was learning how to make a specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound project. And so I think this was really important because it allowed me to set um, deadlines and goal for my goals for myself and make a realistic plan that was achievable and effective um, and that I really was able to achieve in the timeline that I had, which was only a few months. And so I think being able to have also the support of the team leaders and the rest of the cohort to sort of guide me in that process, I think was really helpful and really made a big difference. Um, and I think especially because they came into the, the fellowship not really knowing how to structure this sort of initiative, I think that really played a big role. Um, and also beyond that, just a lot of the concepts that we talked about, about empathy and humility, um, I think to me, what I've learned is that humility means um, understanding that in any sort of social impact work, you are the one that is learning from the community and working to meet their needs. Um, and your project should really be informing, the local community should really be informing your efforts and shaping the design and implementation of whatever project you're doing. Um, and so I think just understanding that although I am a Philly native, I think I'm sort of entering the community as more as an outsider. And so understanding what local community members know best, what resources they need, how can I best serve them? Um, and so I think something that I've really learned is that in any sort of social impact work, it's really crucial to enter the project with the mindset that there's always something to learn from those that you're working with and that you really never will have all the answers. Um, and so that's just sort of a, oh, sorry. I, I, something, I lost control of the screen. Um, so those are just some main um, lessons that I think I really learned from the project, just learning how to include local community members and make them narratives of the story as well and include them in this process of co-creation, um, I think was really important. And also just collaborating and learning from the other fellows was um, really important in this whole process. I think I was really, um, happy to see like all of the support that I got from the fellows and how we were all really excited to work with each other on everyone's projects and offer ideas and really brainstorm. I think most of our sessions ended up being a lot of it towards the end, especially just brainstorming everyone's projects, troubleshooting, learning how we can all help each other, which was really great. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to present. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I can answer those as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Marisa, for your presentation. It was very inspiring to see the motivation behind the project, but also um, uh, to see the results and lessons learned, which is important not only for the continuation of the project, but also when a student might have an idea, a potential idea for a project, it is important to have these lessons learned in mind. Uh, we have received some questions in the chat box. However, in, in consideration of the time, I would appreciate if you could bear with us and uh, wait until the very end, uh, once the presentation has been exhausted, and we, we will do our best to for the questions to be answered. Uh, because of the format of the event, we are only allowing questions to be written uh, or in a written form through the chat box and speakers will um, uh, answer or reply to them accordingly. Um, and with that, I will now give the floor to our next speaker of today is uh, Ms. Melissa Haketa, a student from the University of Zambia in Zambia. Melissa, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melissa Haketa. I am a final year medical student at the University of Zambia, currently living in Osaka, Zambia. I am an active volunteer in various organizations, just to mention Daisy Care Zambia, which promotes health awareness and uh, carries out community health education and St. Dijo Zambia, which I will talk about later. My project was you, me, and the SDGs. My project started in August uh, 2021, at the beginning of my fellowship journey. It was just a small idea, and right now I'm still working on ways in which I can improve it. The project is based on SDG 17, and its main focus really is teaching the community about the SDGs and 
creating awareness because I had noticed that we have so many small groups that are trying to achieve these goals, but they don't have enough exposure or they don't have enough support from other members of the community. And I truly believe that the best solutions are found in the community in which the problems are experienced. So I really believe that through this project, um, we will be able to find solutions that best cater to the communities in which the people are coming from. Right now, my main target group is uh, the school going children. In our local language, we have a saying that says, Imiti Ekula Empanga, which simply means that the seedlings that you plant today will become the forest of tomorrow. So we have volunteers, most of them are my fellows, and we teach students at uh, government uh, institutions give some social media lessons or promote other projects, uh, carry out some don some drives to get some donations. I'll, I'll further explain this and also write a few articles here and there just to inspire other people. I was inspired to do this project um, through my interactions when I realized that a lot of people don't even know what SDG stands for. And a lot of people don't even see how what they're doing, the tiny work that they think they're doing is actually helping us as a community and together as a population in achieving these goals. I truly believe that for us to achieve the goals, we can't leave it only to our policy makers. It starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with all of us. We all play an essential part in this campaign of ours. As a group, we work more in helping especially the underprivileged in finding ways in which they can access the basic needs that they need. And some things that we've done so far is to set up a, an opportunity between an organization that deals with making chairs from recycled paper waste for children with cerebral palsy and an institution that generates a lot of paper waste from their exam scripts, from their assignments. So this uh, institution has agreed to deliver their papers to this organization and this will help them to make more chairs for these children. Another thing that we have done is hosting Christmas kitchens and getting donations to help the elderly in the community and the orphaned. One thing that we are currently working on is let's paint this month red. This is the month of love. And so we took, we took it up to ask people to donate blood for uh, the blood bank at the hospital, at the university hospital, which would really help a lot of other patients. Through social media and hosting discussions with other students at my campus, we have been able to teach more people about SDGs and inform them about the other projects that, the, that my fellows were also carrying out throughout the year. And with the recent opening of community schools, we are starting school clubs to help teach the children about SDGs and encourage them to be innovative, to build that drive in them. It has really been an honor to be part of this fellowship. The MCN fellowship has greatly helped to shape my mindset on what leadership really is. Most of the exercises that we had been involved in really led us to ask questions that helped us to find a deeper meaning to who we were, what our values were, and what our principles and weaknesses are actually. The fellowship helped me grow in confidence, and from learning from both the facilitators and other fellows, I was inspired to hear what people my age are able to do 
with the little resources that they have. Learned a lot, including on what challenges I and others are going to face and how we're going to navigate these challenges and how we should never give up. One thing the fellowship really emphasized on was teamwork and unity. I gained new friends at my campus and other campuses, and this has helped me to gain uh, better teamwork skills and, help and be more empathetic. When I ask myself, where do I see myself in the future? I think I would like to continue and I see myself helping people to learn more about their human rights and the laws, especially women in rural areas where we have a high rate of gender-based violence in my country and child marriages. I thank you all for listening to me today and giving me this opportunity to share with you. If you are interested in learning more about the project and seeing pictures and being active, actively involved, you can follow me and check out the social media pages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa, for your very inspiring presentation. And indeed, it is it is quite rare, I must admit, to see projects related to SDG 17 because it's quite unique that SDG in particular related to uh, partnerships, alliances uh, for the goals and the critical relevance of you know, collaborating and cooperating with a number of stakeholders to advance the goals. And it is critically important as well to realize that most people is perhaps not aware about how how inclusive the SDGs are and how each one of those SDGs touch a number of things uh, from our daily lives. And I was particularly struck by your reference to uh, the plants of the future and the seeds that we plant today. Um, it is important, I believe, when you actually realize that the little pieces of information, of knowledge that people gain about the SDGs it will be a factor for them to be, uh, um, you know, uh, the forefront leaders of tomorrow and the not so distant future to, to claim the need to have public policies that uh, help the communities, particularly those who are suffering the most. So thank you very much indeed for that presentation. Um, I, I will now uh, give the floor to uh, Vaishnavi um, Menon, a student at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in India. Uh, you have the floor now. Hello, uh, my name is actually Vaishnavi Train. There was an error in that. Uh, I'm from India, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, so my project's name is Enhancing Human Capabilities. Uh, we named our project that because uh, ever since starting, uh, ever since deciding to apply for the fellowship, um, my, me and my cohort actually had different areas in which we wanted to work in. Uh, and since the pandemic hit, we were fairly sure that we wouldn't be going back to the campus. So. Uh, collaborating with uh, within the campus might uh, be difficult. So uh, we discussed amongst ourselves and decided to still follow the our areas of interest. So enhancing human capabilities is a, kind of the umbrella term we uh, put to the project. Actually, all of us did, worked on different projects. Uh, some of the members of my cohort uh, did some crowdfunding for the students in Afghanistan and collaborated with the university there. Uh, another collaborated with uh, certain NGOs here to help and volunteer to educate certain ST communities mm -hmm. here. And then there's also uh, uh, three from my cohort did a couple sessions for students in rural areas for menstrual hygiene because uh, many women still use uh, clothes instead of pads or tampons or uh, so they don't yet know the issues that come from it. And I myself actually did a couple of sessions on mental health. Uh, and the story behind that was that uh, while ca talking, catching up with a friend, Bef after my semester, one first semester after the pandemic started, uh, 
she was like feeling very down but she had a lot of work we all do uh we didn't our university didn't want us to get a course lag so we still had work so uh the thing is she wasn't able to do it and my mother is a psychologist so i explained the incident to her and she told me that it might be burnout i am a final year college student and i didn't know what that could be so i figured that many students might not know and that's just an assumption i made so uh i decided to educate students about burnout uh, depression anxiety and stress and the indicators in people and if they do spot it in themselves or others what they can do how they can help the people and what uh, like is if they what they need to do to arrange sessions or whatever they need to do and uh, i've already this i was targeted at students primarily from uh, higher secondary schools high schools and college students as well i pers- i have done uh said tens uh school sessions in schools and three colleges so far and my juniors have also taken this up and created a group within the college and they're uh presently creating their own version of it where they are uh taking my the sessions but they're uh creating a different system of implementation for it uh that, that's actually pretty much so far what do you reach to the project thank you thank you uh thank you the friend thank you for that and uh it is i believe critical when you actually uh think about the 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 consequences of the covid-19 pandemic most people do not realize that one of the most devastating consequences is not necessarily and directly provoked or caused by the virus itself by the disease itself but the the mental health uh, aspect of it uh, somehow has been neglected uh, by many people actually i just pasted on the chat box uh, the website that is available from the world health organization which is part of the united nations system related precisely to the relationship between covid-19 pandemic and 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 uh, and mental health uh, i will now defer to dr abigail because i know she has some insights about that abigail you have the floor Thank you so much. Yeah, it is it is definitely uh, so important to to reach this this important um uh, issues about mental health, physical health in 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 a holistic way, you know, because it is uh now it's it's the time when not, not only our physical health may be on on a danger zone, but but actually uh, our mental health and, and and the people who we love uh could be in danger and we uh must be informed and and must be uh also having the resources to help and to be helped so yeah it is actually very important and we invite you to uh to, to the link that Omar just shared to learn about a little bit more and and just to spread the word because it is so important also to spread uh different resources uh about uh real information and it is uh very important to uh to to for us and for our loved ones thank you so much amar thank you thank you abigail and uh i will now have the privilege to give the floor to uh, aurora pinelli she's a student at the university college london in the united kingdom uh, aurora you have the floor yeah uh, hello everyone i hope you're doing well I'd like to share some slides as well if it's possible. Um so um how can I do this? Um mm. on the top of your screen uh yeah. you'll see an arrow that's check it. Okay. Um so present Well, I can't manage to share, but um, I can. Well, strange. I can't really manage to share my screen. I don't know why. 
Well, I can tell you about my project and maybe share some pictures at the end. Well, basically, um, <clears throat> so I'm Aurora. I study in a double degree in European Social and Political Studies between Sciences Po Paris and UCL in London. And I founded together with um, a group uh, of students at UCL, the Next Chapter Project. There is a project that is happening at the same time in Sicily, um, in the south of Italy and in London, because I come from Sicily in the first place. Um, and I've been particularly stroke since I was a kid. Uh, so basically, at least since uh, 2015, by the um, migration phenomenon that has um, unfortunately um, hit my, my island. Um, so basically, Sicily is the main arrival um, together with uh, with Greece. Is the main uh, is the main um, place of arrival of migrants and refugees coming mainly from the Mediterranean route, which is a route that um, comes that um, that is made that is that migrants under. Uh, mainly from Africa and then they pass through Libya and uh, they um, get into some boats and, and, and come to Sicily, first into the, an island that is called Lampedusa that is in the very south and then they are moved all around Italy but of course the main island of Sicily is the one that is uh, particularly stroke. So um, basically, I realized that the island where I was, uh, like mm -hmm. the sea where I was um, swimming every day, like enjoying my life, was also becoming kind of a mass grave in which many uh, kids, women, and and men were were um, dying every day uh, to try to find a better place. And I realized that one of the main challenge of my territory was the integration, the inclusion, and like to develop a cultural channel, like dialogue chan channels of dialogue in which people can, and, and particularly like new generation, can try to understand this phenomenon without um, uh, having the filtering of um, social media, political discourses that m many times are focused on getting votes rather than trying to make people understand their diversities and come together. Um, to understand what they have, uh, what kind of similarities do they have rather than, than differences. And um, so that's why I decided with this, uh, I developed a partnership uh, with a reception center. There is a, um, that is called uh, the Centra Stalli, which is a, a center that was established in Italy in 1980, uh, in the 1980s, but um, in Sicily it was uh, established in 2003. And that whole and the main aim is to allow migrants to and refugees to understand their trauma um, and to express it through um, dialogue experience. But also, uh, they also do work of advocacy to change policies, and they also give all kinds of support uh, from from the administrative support to the um, to the yeah, legal support. Etc. And together we developed um, an educational tool um, that could allow um, middle schoolers and high schoolers to um, to do a like an educational process uh, in which they can learn more about the reality of of migration and what does it mean to be a migrant. First, like I would just would like to remind what's the definition. Of, of a refugee. So a refugee, according to the 1951 Geneva Convention, is someone who has fled their country uh, due to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for uh, reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Um, so what we did is to contact more than uh, 14 schools and like middle schools and high schools in Palermo. Um, and we involved more than 1,000 students to uh, have uh, to ex to do um, a path with their professors, uh, thanks to some educational sheets that we uh, structured, that we developed to learn about uh, several aspects of migration. So uh, the different the, um, the main um, topics are, uh, for example. Uh, kids, uh, refugee kids, uh, war and persecutions, the the um, the asylum system and the legal system, so that students can also understand legally how 
our societies are based, like what does it mean to be a refugee, what are the, their rights, um, their obligations and stuff, um, to know about, about human rights, um, refugee women, um, um, so uh, refugee kids, refugees in Italy, so to learn about what is the real situation in Italy, uh, and then understand uh, to know about like uh, um, um, and, uh, how does as an intercultural society uh, look like. So our project uh, is, is tackling currently uh, the um, so SDG four and SDG ten, which are so SDG four is quality education, and SDG ten is reduced inequalities. And these do these two um, SDGs are very interconnected because you can um, you can have a quality education if you learn about human rights and if you learn about other people's diversity, so that you can uh, reduce inequalities through um, the way you you develop people's behavior. So in a way. Um, like young uh, young students from 10 years old until like 18, 19 years old, because in Italy we finish high school at 19 years old, are going to be formed by their professors uh, to learn about um, um, what does it mean to overcome diversities and, and to learn about a phenomenon that is very crucial today um, and, and even more for new generations. And so um, the very important thing, the very, the, the main um, characteristic of this project is that um, at the end of the, of the months of formation, uh, like of education and, and uh, of the development of critical thinking of students uh, uh, concerning the, the, the migration route uh, and the Mediterranean route and the integration issues in Italy, uh, they will be visiting uh, the, um, the reception center itself, so they will understand how a reception center looks like, they will understand what are the opportunities in terms of volunteering in their territory, and they will participate, they will meet uh, a refugee that will tell about uh, his or her experience and tell about his or her testimony. So they will have, they are, they are doing uh, the educational process to, under, to be able to meet someone that through his or her experience can explain what being a refugee meant, means, and will mean for him, him or her. And um, then uh, they will also produce some artistic um, uh, and materials. So they will be participating in, um, in narrative um, um, like races uh, among, and in, uh, they are going to happen like with students coming from all over Sicily and Italy as well. So they will be, um, and, and there are two competitions that are one happening for middle schools and one for high schoolers. And then the particularity is that uh, in the, we will be organizing an exhibition in London. So at UCL, the university I'm attending right now to allow students to express themselves not only through um, uh, art, uh, no, sorry, through uh, um, education, but also like, sorry, through um, writing, but also through other artistic um, means. So, for example, uh, music, art, video making, photographs, and so we will be. So we developed some criteria so that we can evaluate them, select some works, and then uh, expose here at UCL. And the other uh, specificity oh. is that we will be um, so the, the the exhibition will work as a, a conversation between the works of new generation high schoolers learning about migration and the work of a migrant, a refugee that I met. He came as an unaccompanied minor in Sicily and uh, he's trying to become a, a photographer now. And he um, developed, an, um, like he made some pictures and he developed a, um, an exhibition in, that is called First View because he shows his perception of, of the the country of first arrival, or I would say the the island of first arrival, uh, that is Sicily. So in a way, during this exhibition, we will have the perception of of new generations, uh, the, the perception perception of of migration from new generations from the host country, and the perception of the host country from a migrant. And uh, this will be kind of a conversation be in terms of like human perceptions of, of migration. And I guess that uh, the Millennium Fellowship thought to be, um, to be 
well, self-confident also to manage two countries at uh, two projects happening in two countries at the same time, like the UK and Sicily, um, to manage this in the context of pandemic. So do online meetings and and also get the schools and students engagement, even though we are far. Um, and I guess also to co co cooperate with the, the other uh, colleagues I'm working with that come from all over the world, from Hong Kong, Greece, France. So I guess, yeah, I became a bit of multitasking and also to be kind of empathetic to develop an educational tool that is actually making people uh, talk about the, the, the hardest uh, challenges and sufferings they've experienced, because in Libya they can also experience um, so uh, torture. So yeah, this is me. And if you have questions, of course, I'm happy to, to respond. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aurora, uh, for that presentation. And it's um, indeed important to to remind uh, ourselves and to remind the audience that when a person uh, is forced to flee uh, his or her country of origin or nationality, is not a personal choice. Uh, it's something that they need to do in order to preserve their their life, to to preserve their safety and to ensure a better future for their family. Nobody chooses to be a refugee. Um, and when it comes to economic migrants, we have to realize that many people is actually forced by the circumstances of natural disasters, uh, climate change, uh, complex emergencies, uh, hunger, starvation, uh, extreme poverty to leave their, their, their places, to leave everything behind and to go somewhere else. And uh, you, you mentioned a word that is key, uh, is, is instrumental, is empathy. And uh, we, we need to, to, to inspire, to instill uh, empathy. Uh, and I believe this project tied in that ties um, SDG 4. Actually, when we, when we go to SDG 4, particularly target 4.7, it talks about education for human rights, for global citizenship, for sustainable development. And it is important that education needs to be understood from the perspective that education for human rights, education to create not only knowledge about human rights and fundamental freedom, but also to create this connection, this human connection. The more the more we know what's going on outside of, uh, of our of our regular places of work or residence, the more we know about the circumstances, this, the critical challenges and situations, and the complex scenarios that have been are being faced by millions around the world while we are here talking at this precise moment many thousands of people are, are trying to leave their homes looking for a, a safe place to be while we are talking here imagine how many thousands of people have left their countries do, during the time that this virtual event has elapsed so it, it, it is i congratulate you aurora for, for that project of yours um, and last but not least uh, we have with us uh, the last speakers of the day. We have Nayab Mohammed. Uh, she's a student at the Montfort University in the United Kingdom, which is also the UNAI SDG hub for Goal 16. Uh, Nayab, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I have something to share too, so let me just quickly do that. Mm -hmm. I've got a bit of a fun PowerPoint to yes. do. Um, hi, so my name is Naya Mohammed. I'm a second year fashion design student at De Montfort University, which, like you said, is the global SDG 16 hub. Um, everyone's been talking about where they're from, but I feel like I'm a bit of a global citizen since I'm, I'm Indian, but have Mozambican, Portuguese and British heritage too. Um, I'm really excited to be here. It's been extremely motivating to hear about everyone's efforts and it has reassured me that we can, we can do it. Um, I started working in the fashion industry in Leicester at 17 and what I saw was the opposite of glamorous. At the time, sustainability in fashion wasn't necessarily trendy and although I had heard of sweatshops, never in my wildest dreams did I think they were happening right on my doorstep. Um, after having seen everything from, after having seen everything with my own eyes, I became heavily interested in sustainability and researched everything from, envir from the environmental tools and the humanitarian co conflicts. My goal became to try and fix the problems that I saw. For you to get a grasp of, grasp of it, the fashion industry emits more carbon than the international flights and maritime shipping combined. Just let that sink in for a second. Today I'm going to talk about one of the projects that I've been working on at DMU, Envirogreen. In November of 20, 2020, um, I attended the Eco Cafe, a regular event organised by the DMU Sustainability Team where a bunch of people that care basically come together. Hannah, a student, suggested the idea of a vertical allotment and Regina Frank, a lecturer, suggested that the enterprise society enact us and the Environmental Society Go Eco collaborate. 
I thought that since I was, I was in both societies, I could make this happen. Originally, we were focusing on SDGs 2, 3 and 13. We took the idea forward and secured a seed grant by the JMU Sustainability Team to cover costs and seeds um, and equipment. And the amazing estate team, consisting of Dan, Dan Kirk and Paul Bain, managed to find us this wonderful space at the university. During this time, I had gotten into textiles and was looking at some of the impacts of dyes in the environment and found what I found was shocking. I found that not that these dyes were not only killing our planet and marine life, but also human beings, simply because it was the easiest and cheap, cheapest thing to do. Currently at uni, we have a bunch of dyes available for free, but no natural ones. So I thought, why not create a subject, sub-project and create a dye garden? So now, as well as planting fruit and veg to be eaten, we are also going to be planting herbs and veg that dye will be achieved from. So the pro project also led us to playing an impact on SDGs 6, 12 and 14. Since we have to deal with the UK weather and we aren't able to start planting until March, our amazing project leader, Tanjit Paul, organised a tree planting day with the local council. We managed to plant just over 100 trees in just one day. I really like to emphasise all the names I mentioned and many more that I didn't have a chance to. Without the participation and help from every single one of these people, this wouldn't have been possible. I'm a strong believer in collaboration leading to sustainability, so on that note, I've added my Instagram with DMU12. My hope from this project is not only to be sustainable now, but to show everyone from the volunteers helping harvest fruit and, veg fruit and vegetables to the fashion students using the dye that sustainability is possible. If even half these people involved implement this mindset in their future careers, just imagine how much of an impact this project can have. From fashion students implementing dye gardening into their new workplaces to business students growing their own pesticide free veg and showing the younger generations to do the same. On that note, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Naya, for that presentation of yours and for highlighting that regardless of what we are studying, we can also do um, and make a difference and the importance of collaboration, which was highlighted in your last slide, and um, the importance of reforestation. Actually, as we speak, many, many of the environmental challenges uh, that are being caused by, by you know, not taking into consideration sustainable variables uh, in, 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 in the industry and so, so many areas, particularly industries that are, that are critical for the economies of the developing world, is precisely an example of what students can do uh, when they come together uh, and when they realize that the reforestation and afforestation in Shanghai are actually two key solutions that are being promoted actively by the UN Environment Program, uh, by the UN Development Program as well. So it's a UN wide um, initiative, and I'm very pleased to see that in. Uh, been implemented and been uh, put into action uh, by uh, your university and uh, the, your your leadership uh, uh, along with the students that are part of the university as well. So thank you very much indeed uh, and my appreciation to you and to our friends in the Montfort University. Um, with that, it is time now to go to the Q&A session. And again, uh, because of the format of the event, we are only allowing questions to and comments to be posted and written in the chat box. Um, we already received some questions and uh, we are very, actually we are very uh, thrilled to see uh, so uh, so lively interaction uh, through the chat box between the, the students. This is wonderful for us. Um, and I have a couple of questions that although were addressed specifically to, to uh, specific speakers, I think they can be uh, applied to all speakers actually. Uh, and these are two very generic yet common and important questions. One, it's about the funding, because some things that you are doing might need some financial resources to be able to be uh, actually implemented. So um, one question would be, how did you manage to get funding for that? Uh, is funding was, is or uh, was a funding, a fundamental problem that, that you encounter when, when you develop the ideas for the project and when you actually executed the projects themselves. And the second question is, uh, which were the challenges? Um, challenges can, can be as diverse as uh, you needed the support of the university or you needed the support of other stakeholders, how did you approach them and so on. So the floor is open to the speakers that would like to address these two um, first questions.
Well, I can discuss about uh, the challenges if you sure. if you want. Sure. Um, so in terms of challenges, I guess um, it also to, of course, you need to develop your um, kind of public speaking capacity or just your capacities to talk to everyone. Because when you are discussing with people coming from different backgrounds, it is really like the way you 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 adapt to each individual is very important. So of course, the way I'm going to talk to the UCL director is not the same uh, of the reception center or of, of students or professors coming from um, Sicily. And I guess um, one, one challenge was so the way I, I approach the, the stakeholders, so the reception center, since I already cared about this topic a lot and I was already engaged in the territory every time I was coming back, I was already engaged uh, and I was already doing volunteering um, uh, um, in Sicily. It was relatively not easy, but it was I managed to get the confidence of, of uh, the director of the reception center. So what I would say is, is that one of the things that is important is like to keep um, um, uh, credibility in the way you, you show like and also to be kind of in, in, in integral, like to show that you really that you are engaged for a long time and that you can you you are actually bringing something and also create rich. You always have to create richness whatever you do to understand what can be um, a, a point in common and and uh, and uh, a source of richness for every stakeholder you you find and I guess yeah I guess the main challenge is to um, to be to be heard to make to convince people to listen to you and and that what you have to offer and your point of view is uh, interesting and, and and I guess also to keep your team keep the motivation of the team because it's very easy just to say yeah let's stop to do it it's too complicated we have exams we have university we have uh, like and also and when you decide to take the responsibility to be the leader of the group and to be the one everyone is looking at uh, concerning the project like the main reference uh, reference of everyone it becomes complicated and for example right now i i have covid and i was very sick last week so being able um, to keep on making presentations with schools, coordinate 13 schools and, and coordinate the team in London while at the same time the, the team in Sicily and keep your credibility even when you are sick. Uh, in, uh, it's like one of the, of, of the greatest challenges that I think we can all overcome if we believe in it, I guess. Well, it is truly remarkable, Aurora. I wasn't aware uh, of, of that. I wish you speedy recovery and so our appreciation for you taking the time to join us uh, for this event. Um, now, yeah. Um, um, yeah, well done Aurora for doing that. I don't know how you managed that. Um, but yeah, it's hard to do as a team. I can't imagine how you did it by yourself. But um, again, I feel like um, I'd like to point out collaboration again, because like I had um, the university um, offer seed grants. I had never filled out a seed grant. I'm not a um, academic person per se, I'm a really creative person, but we managed to find people who were academic people, they were business students who were literally learning how to uh, fill out C grants, and I'm sure in the university you have some people that are studying that and are as passionate, so you what you need to do, in my opinion, is find these people, find these people and then work together, because you you might be strong at creatives, one person might be strong at academics, and together you can literally make everything happen, and I never filled out a C grant, but we literally got offered like um, six hundred pounds by the university to start this project, and I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself at all. Thank you, Naya, for that comment. And I don't know if if Noha and Abigail are still on the line, um, because we got a uh, uh, we got a comment or a question that perhaps you might be uh, inclined to to respond to. It's about this the imposter syndrome. Uh, which is which actually I, I I I'm too honest I never thought about it when in relation to this but perhaps a student has a wonderful idea and the student is fully motivated and have the the resources to 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 lead the project but at, at the very beginning of the project or perhaps in the middle he or she can say I might not be as you know as good as he can as I can be May, maybe I, I'm not capable enough maybe I don't have the I, I'm not smart enough to 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 lead this project. So what would you respond on based on your experience uh, from the MCN side? 
Hi, I, I can go first if you want. Thank you. Well, uh, imposter syndrome. Unfortunately, it's 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 a term that it, now it's uh, now it's being like a little bit famous because uh, it's actually very common. You, you know, uh, we all feel it in a in a way in in certain times of of our lives. The the important thing, as my own experience, is to uh, face it. Uh, just day one day at a time. Uh, just maybe you you can feel that you are not enough to 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 create a task, a project, a dream. But you actually are. We are we are all cap capable to 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 follow our dreams, to create different projects, to collaborate with other people because we are humans. So if we if you have a a dream, a project, if you want to to help, you don't have to be even like um, also a graduated person or, or a lawyer or a doctor or anything. You just have to be the insensitive to, to do it. Uh, find some mentors, find some, uh, uh, how to learn some skills, collaborate with your peers and you will get there. And, and one day at a time, if you are able to, to create a change, you are, you are already doing it just by thinking about it. So yeah, that's that's what uh, I can say about it. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Noha. Yeah, and uh, you know, I will I will say one of the one of the major things that I, I I feel really excited about when it comes to the Millennium Fellowship is that one, you choose a topic that you're passionate about, and two, um, we intentionally made it cohort based um, with you and I. So we want to make sure that there is a support system when you start a project, even if you're the only person leading on it, but you're working with uh, students in your university that you can meet with regularly that can continue to motivate you and that can continue to support you in different ways, whether it be by, you know, looking at challenges that you're facing and helping to walk through them or just figuring out like some of the like Abigail said, the skills through the training sessions on on smart goals, um, like uh, Marissa mentioned earlier, and and things that can help you break down goals that may seem very big into smaller steps and can help you tackle the the imposter syndrome and feel like you can do it. And 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 there are you know steps to take it. Um, there are two aspects of the Millennium Fellowship that all Millennium Fellows partake in, which is um, global webinars that we have with um, leaders from around the world, both from um, you know UN and private sector and public sector for for people who can you know share their work experiences and talk about the work that they're doing and how they navigate really important questions like, you know, dealing with imp imposter syndrome. Um, and it's an opportunity for Millennium Fellows to, to, to learn and, and receive mentorship from people that are now doing, you know, a lot of the things that um, Millennium Fellows are doing, but maybe for a full time uh, work position. Um, and then the second piece is SDG Conversation Hours, which is a, an opportunity for Millennium Fellows around the world to come together and talk things through and be able to, you know, um, create a conversation and create a little bit of a um a community that's on a global level and be able to talk about it. So um, so I think, you know, by setting up these small support systems, um, both on your campus, both globally and from mentors, um, you know, uh, hopefully that, you know, that helps in being able to navigate, you know, the the, the challenges that you may be facing in imposter syndrome. Um, and, and a big part of also, I would say that the final piece of it is we're not looking for perfection or, or heroes. And that's a big piece of, of the Millennium Fellowship. We, we really want you to explore and use the platform of the the Millennium Fellowship as a place to, to learn about what can you do um, during the time of the of the program and beyond. And so, you know, looking at, you know, you know, smaller tasks, looking at, you know, things that you're really passionate about and exploring what you can do with them with, you know, very particular goals that you set for yourself. So, um, you know, uh, taking it, taking it realistically and we'll, we'll be there to support in, in kind of, you know, supporting students and taking it, um, you know, in smaller steps to be able to um, to manage the, the the, the way that is, you know, complex social issues that all of us as a, as a you know, as a global movement are trying to um, to achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noha, for those insights. Uh, actually, we have a couple of questions that are related to funding as well. I don't know if either MCN or the speakers would like to address this. One is how do you approach donors if you're seeking funding? And the other is what kind of 
different sources for funding that are available for university students. Um, so we would like to take the floor on that. I'm happy to step in here a little bit on the MCN side. Um, so for the Millennium Fellowship, you know, the, the program is, is leadership development. And so one of the things that we recognized is that, you know, it's really important as part of the skill set that fellows should be receiving is, is being able to think about, you know, does my project need funding? I think that's question number one, because there are so many projects out there that you can do from home. And we've seen it with especially when COVID started, um, where people started to think about what are the skills and the resources that I have have and how can I be able to leverage those and create impact um, with the resources that I have? And so, um, and then the second piece is uh, actually creating as part of the curriculum and the training sessions, you know, skills on fundraising and budgeting and approaching donors and being able to have the skill set so that, you know, rather than being part of a program that gives you a, a, an amount of money and that ends, developing a skill that you can then leverage for multiple organizations. And, and we want to be able to create that um, for, for all of the students that are participating with us. Um, so I would say we rely on you know supportive partners and, and people in, in the kind of larger community to be able and resource and try to share opportunities um, to uh, fellows in the community. Um, and I think you know there are so many out there, um, especially if you have a very specific focus, um, whether it be climate change or um, you know no poverty or quality education. There are very uh, you know so many opportunities out there that are looking for. Um, you know, passionate young people, and I'm not saying like amazing and superheroes, but like passionate young people that really want to create change and have a specific vision for what they want to do um, to be able to, you know, take that, you know, forward through funding measures. Um, but I think it's really important to think about what are the skills that I can build for myself. And um, and I would say, you know, part, part of that has been, you know, through the fellowship and, and through the training sessions. Uh, I'm sure fellows have different experiences here too. So I also want to um, recognize that you know uh there are there are a few uh you know there are probably different experiences for everybody here in the call to to share so uh, i'll also you know uh pass it on there as well yeah thank you Noha. and also um our executive director sam Vegar, it's commenting on the chat some resources helpful uh for for people who are starting a project and would like to uh, to fund their projects, and yeah, we encourage you as well as a check check on them and and and, and trying to, to figure out how, how to do it because uh, uh, as 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 far as as funding uh, must be hard, it 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 doesn't have to be a a barrier. So uh, so hopefully with with these learning skills and and. And with these uh, great connections all around the world, uh, we can be able to help you and to also advise you and give all, all of uh, the support that we can. Thank you. Thank you both Noha and Abigail. As, as Nayab said, find the right people. Uh, find the right people either outside of the campus or even in your own university. There might be people who, who you know, is familiar with these funding opportunities um, that have connections with the private sector, with foundations. With uh, there are a number of, uh, you know, um, opportunities there that uh, and the universities, the staff of the university in charge of those uh, fields, you know, might be the right person. And if not, they can pull you to the right person in order to get uh, the proper information. Um, so I, I, I again. Uh, and we are at the UN, whenever we do a project, uh, funding is always one of the key uh, issues that is part of the of the work related to the project itself. Having said that, uh, because we are running out of time, uh, I have been privileged to, to moderate this session for you and to have our friends from uh, MCN and MCN folks from around the world, in addition to uh, the students from our UNAI SDG Hub for Goal 16 in the UK, and to, to see, uh, you know, it is very inspiring to see because when, when, we, when we heard about each one of the stories, there, there is something in common. Every single student felt inspired and they decided to do something about it or based on that inspiration and motivation. This is critical because the actual title of this event is Youth Innovation in the Decade of Action. 
because the idea is that we are in the decade of action for the SDGs because the time to to you know to theorize about the SDG, the, the, the time to discuss about the SDGs, that time has passed a long time ago, particularly because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the time now is to put our thoughts, our ideas, our ideals into action. So we have heard today wonderful stories from our young students in different universities around the world. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, the recording of this session will be shared likely later today, if not later this week, uh, to those uh, who registered for the event. And uh, we can ask you to share uh, the video to those who might be interested uh, in this conversation. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening from the United Nations in New York. Thank you very much to all.